Okay, good morning everyone. Um, it's 9 o'clock on the West Coast. I'm Alex Boot, co-director of the BDK Center's Coordination Center. Uh, today we're continuing section 4 on data modeling and inference methods. And one type of method that some of you may have already encountered in your own studies or work, or at least heard of, um, are related to Bayesian techniques. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Professor Michael Newton, a professor of statistics and biostatistics and medical informatics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, advanced site, good, great. Um, uh, Dr. Newton is an associate director of the Center for Predictive Computational Phenotyping, CPCP, uh, C, uh, one of the national BDTK centers of excellence. Dr. Newton has led many novel applications of statistical techniques and algorithms on biomedical big data. For instance, he was the first to use Markov chain Monte Carlo in phylogenetic analysis, as well as the use of mixed models for analyzing high dimensional gene expression changes. A longstanding interest of Professor Noon is in the area of Bayesian and empirical Bayesian computations. And he'll be uh, talking to us today about Bayesian inference methods. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Noon this morning. Michael, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Alex. Well, uh, hello, everybody. It's great to be here. Thanks for tuning in. I do hope you find something useful in today's webinar. So uh, the pics on this first slide uh, show or signify some projects and activities that I've been involved in in my own work. Uh, and the, they may show up in examples as we go through today. Well, uh, uh, Bayesian inference is a big deal. Uh, lots of researchers have thought a lot about it and how it can be used to advantage in data analysis. There are a few books on the topic, and I encourage you to take a closer look. Uh, my goal today is to be sort of a cheerleader for Bayesian methods, pointing out some of their basic features and also some opportunities in this new world of data science. Uh, but uh, in addition to my job, there's some things for you to do too. Uh, you can uh, join the Society for Bayesian Analysis. You can uh, check out the American Statistical Association section. Uh, you can check out online the, the journal Bayesian Analysis. You could, uh, in fact, visit Duke University, where it's the, one of the strong uh, centers for Bayesian inference and research in these techniques. Uh, you could check out some code. Uh, Andrew Gelman's uh, originated this terrific uh, code project called STAN that uh, delivers some really useful techniques for uh, software techniques for deploying Bayesian analysis. Um, so that's some of the things you can do. I'm going to just uh, give you a bit of an overview of what Bayesian analysis is, some of the key features about it, and um, how it goes in some examples. So it's a general strategy for data analysis based on probability. And the key thing about it is it couples data with some kind of model specification. And that model specification has two features. It's got a probability structure for the data themselves given unknown things. This reflects kind of the central dogma of statistics that all data sets are the realization of some random process. And encoding that in probability is, is kind of central. But then the second part of it <coughs> has to do with all the unknown parameters, say. Uh, and there's some probability structure on that, too, that's a special part of Bayesian analysis. It essentially expands the domain of probability to be a general measure of uncertainty. And then inference about what we don't know, given what we know, is, uh, is, uh, proceeds using the rules of probability. OK, well, I'm going to talk about a few uh, sort of relevant examples, but I wanted to start with a kind of irrelevant example, but it's still pedagogically interesting about thumbtacks. So here's a little video. Of, I'm doing an experiment to collect some data. I'm tossing a thumbtack, and it noticed that I tossed that tack, and it landed with its point facing down. I replicated that experiment uh, again, and I tossed the tack, and it happened to land with its point facing up. And, uh, and this was the beginning of a, of a longer experiment that I did with 50 trials, the outcomes of which a full data set is shown here. I got uh, in my 50 trials, it turned out, 17 times that the, uh, the tack landed with its top side, with its point facing down. Now, we know from the law of large numbers <coughs> that the relative frequency at which the tack lands with its uh, tip point facing down, that D over N, that relative frequency is, uh, well, it's random variable for one thing, but also it stabilizes. In the long run, if I were to have continued the experiment, tossing tacks indefinitely, it would converge to something we'll call theta, the long run relative frequency of times that the tack lands with its head pointing down. And that's a parameter of the system, a property of the tack in the experimental system. 
and it's an unknown underlying parameter uh, underneath the data set. So we could, of course, estimate that unknown theta with 17 out of 50, 34 percent, but, but at issue really are, uh, in, <coughs> in our uh, focus are asking more general inference questions such as what are plausible values of that parameter having observed 17 uh, heads uh, points down in 50 tusks. And uh, rather than go through the math of it, uh, I just wanted to present this, answer this question, a Bayesian would answer, but through a simulation. So in this uh, first part of the simulation, suppose we happen to know this long run relative frequency theta. If we did, we could surely uh, run the experiment in the computer and uh, replicate it. So let me, this little panel shows uh, uh, is sort of set up to understand replications of this little tack tossing experiment. I've got possible values of theta on the on the horizontal, and I've got possible values of data on the vertical. And the observed value of the data is the 17 times that the tack face pointing down out of 50 trials. Now I look at the little code chunk up in the upper right here. This is uh, my in silico experiment. I could <coughs> fix theta, for instance, if I knew it at say 60% and set up this little code, which just is a way of using random numbers, pseudo-random numbers in the computer to simulate the tack tossing without actually tossing the tack 50 times. But this is a, a replicate of that if I knew that long run relative frequency. And I happen when I do that to get about 26. Now since it's a simple bit of code, I can repeat it. <coughs> Obviously I can repeat it. And look, I did it about a thousand times. And this is, represents the so-called sampling distribution. As you will recognize the binomial sampling distribution of the relative of, of the values of the number of, uh, of point down tax out of 50, centered around 60% of 50, around 30, but with some fluctuation. And notice that the value, observed value 17, doesn't look very plausible uh, for that data set. But in that little, uh, you know, and that's basically a problem with this little simulation. I've I've had to pretend I know the value of this unknown parameter when in fact I don't. Now as I do that simulation, I could just change it a little bit. If you look up here, I just, as I uh, imagine what data I might have happened, I might have gotten, uh, let me also uh, vary the value of the parameter theta by just grabbing a uniformly distributed theta every time. And on that uniformly distributed theta, then go ahead and simulate my uh, outcome of my my, my experiment. This is what you get if you do it about a thousand times. Now, <clears throat> now what's round in gray there is uh, these are hypothetical repetitions of the experiment that I've set up in this two-stage experiment where uh, the simulated data are actually exactly the same as the data that I happen to see in my real experiment. So surely those values of those parameters that gave rise to, to those, data, those simulated data must be plausible because in light of the data that I saw, they could easily have given rise to the same data as we saw in the simulation. So that is the essence of what Bayesian analysis is. It's looking at the distribution of those theta values. Now, we've conditioned effectively on that 17, and we can project down onto the, the theta axis right now. And so I've just taken this, boosted the simulation size up a bit. But this is the this distribution of thetas that came out of this experiment, where I first simulate theta, and then I get simulated data, given theta, but then I keep a track of the thetas that match my observed data. These are certainly plausible values. Well, indeed, mathematically, we can work out the formula for that curve. It's known as the posterior distribution. Its functional form is known, and it expresses a kind of uncertainty in the value of theta that would have generated the data we saw, but the uncertainty expressed after the data have been seen. Uh, that's to contrast it with the uncertainty that we expressed in this little simulation before the data were seen. Remember that our unif chunk of code which said that what the theta values are uh, before, uh, what theta values I'm considering is relevant in advance of having seen the data. And this connection, the connection, the famous formula that the posterior is proportional to the prior times the likelihood, this likelihood now coming from the binomial model in our case, goes way back to Thomas Bayes himself. Now, looking at that functional form, this is the this thing. This beast is the is the object that is critical for inference. So we could take a we don't know that theta. We have a summary of our uncertainty about it. If we take the center value, the mean of that distribution, its expected value, that could serve as a point estimate. 
And it happens in this case that the balance point of the distribution is, is uh, uh, a little different than the, the what you would think of as the natural estimator 17 over 50. It's, it's a little bit modified. It's, as we say, shrunken towards the prior mean, which is a half, compared to the MLA. We could also get an interval that contains a certain amount of that posterior probability. So that's that's how it would go in this little toy example. Now, let's take a, <clears throat> a second less toy example, intestinal tumors. Now here the data aren't uh, outcomes of a tack throwing experiment, but they're outcomes of uh, looking, inside the, looking inside the DNA of polyps that were found uh, during colonoscopy of men in a, in a study. Detectable pathogenic mutations from 36 colonic polyps. There's the data here. The horizontal, the horizontal corresponds to the 36 different subjects in the study. The vertical are the rows correspond to different pathogenic mutations that were measured, assessed by sequencing, different genes that are known to be critically involved in the development of colon cancer. That's the data. These are detectable, so they have to have appeared at a sufficiently high frequency in the sequencing of the tumor. This comes from a recent publication by Chelsea Sievers and uh, Rich Halberg's group here at Madison. Okay, now uh, <clears throat> I have to give, before I uh, tell a bit about the model, I have to say something about uh, colon cancer progression. Uh, the, this little cartoon on the left shows the wall of, uh, just a tiny segment of the wall of the intestinal epithelium. And uh, the green piece here has been converted. Uh, it's, it's initiated to be, it's non-normal, and it's starting to become uh, cancerous. Uh, the polyps are essentially at this stage. The data is coming at this stage, early abnormal growth outside of this uh, structure here. And eventually, if things go wrong, you'll get a cancer. But the data that we're talking about are data early at another stage. I also want to point out a basic uh, structural unit of the <coughs> intestinal wall that's expressed here in cross-section in this cartoon. The, the intestinal wall is made up of these um, millions, I guess, of these barrel-shaped glands called crypts. They're actually thousands of cells, not just a handful of cells here. And they're clonal, so essentially they all come from uh, stem cells at the bottom of the, this the space. So they have, they're, they're from a single lineage. That's going to be important in something I'll say later. Uh, they are from a single lineage. And they're, they're uh, the basic structural unit of the intestine, like I said, and also uh, tumors, uh, when they start, or uh, for initially adenomas, they emerge out of these crypts and they start to grow. There's a whole bunch of interesting things about crypt biology I won't say, but the crypt itself is going to be an important thing for my story. So, uh, okay, so previously we tossed tacks in silico, but now instead of tossing tacks in silico, I'm going to do a, a simulation of tumor growth. Uh, it's a discrete step simulation. It's not cells that are shown here, but actually crypts that uh, proceed. Uh, this evolves by a certain stochastic model that you can read about in the paper. Essentially, crypts may fission. They turn into multiple crypts, or they could potentially die. And also, the crypts, these clonal bodies, may incur certain mutations as they go along. The colors that you may be able to see here, there's different colors, correspond to different uh, mutations that have occurred and then grown out. So this is an interesting thing. So it's not tossing attack, but it's growing a, uh, a tumor. Now, uh, well, what, could Siever, what did Sievers do? They would simulate these tumors, and then they'd mimic the sampling process. They did an in silico section of the tumor, looked at the clones, at the crypts inside. Basically, we're trying to match what they observed here with their observed data on the 36. Now, in the Sievers paper, they do something very light. Instead of conditioning on all 36, they just uh, ask a very, very simple question. Uh, it's a little bit different than conditioning all the data. They just ask, at the level of a mutation that you would see in here, does the frequency at which that mutation occur, does it uh, exist at, at a sufficiently high frequency to be detected by the next generation sequencing technology that's used? And their lower threshold was that the mutant frequency had to be bigger than 10% in order for uh, the sequencing to observe. Is it a detectable mutation? Now, ideally, in fact, we would simulate <clears throat> not just one tumor up to check for its mutation, but we would simulate a sample of these polyps or tumors. And you'd wait and you'd see if, they, if the mutation profile in slices of these things matched our observed sample. We don't do that. Sievers didn't do that. But I just point the interest of the observers to this paper. It just came out earlier this week. 
by Marjoram's group that, uh, that does essentially that kind of a calculation. In any case, in the simple calculation that we're talking about, where we simulate up, instead of tossing a tack, we're simulating up a, a tumor that's growing in the intestine through a stochastic model of how tumors might grow. The, and we look at a mutation that's shown up at the time that we observe the tumor. The quantity of interest uh, in Siever's paper was <coughs> the size of the tumor in CRIPS when the mutation that we're looking at happened to have emerged. So when we see it at observation time, we get to see a mutation at some frequency. But that mutation must have emerged in the tumor growth sometime before we got to observe it. That time isn't known to the, obs the observer. That's the parameter, theta sub mu. And the, rig the simulation's rigged up so that these tumor uh, mutations can emerge at any time along the, uh, uh, they can emerge at any time in the sense of any size that the tumor is as it's growing. But if we condition on the data, so to speak, that we condition on the fact that the mutation is actually exists at sufficiently high frequency to be detectable when we measure it, then we get a posterior distribution of the size of the tumor when that mutation arose. And, and looking at these kind of distributions tells us that these detectable mutations must have arisen when the tumor was actually quite small. And you can get specific inferences about that. So that's an interesting variation of the simulation story, where instead of simulating tax, we're simulating tumors. But the same story, you simulate uh, unknown things, data, un simulated data, until that data is equal or approximately equal to the observed data that you have, and you keep a track of the quantity theta that corresponds to it. This simulation view of the Bayesian inference was uh, one of the number of uh, terrific insights made by Don Rubin in his uh, paper that I recommend highly to everybody on sequ uh, frequency calculations that are relevant for Bayesian analysts. It's also the basis of what people now call approximate Bayesian computation. That's a sp especially useful in situations where the likelihood functions are intractable, such as in population genetics or in other forms of ancestral inference. Okay, so that's just a little uh, supposed to whet your appetite about Bayes uh, from a simulation perspective. I want to talk about um, three main features of Bayes going forward now with the rest of my time. So I want to talk about three basic things, handling uncertainty, combining different data sources, and borrowing strength. And I'll use three different uh, uh, case study examples to illustrate these features of Bayesian inference. So let's go forward. Handling uncertainty. So this is one of the sort of basic features of Bayes that uh, <coughs> you know that we're always uh, you know we understand that data uh, doesn't tell us all the information even if it's big data it doesn't have you know, for things we're interested about it may not contain all the information so we have to be able to express our uncertainty about things that we don't quite know and Bayes is rigged up for that so let's say in addition to a parameter theta that we we might be interested in there's some other parameter psi and uh, Bayes procedure somehow or other through a model specification gives rise to a joint posterior distribution of all the unknowns given the data that we have. Well, if we're really just interested in theta somehow, then um
Michael, we're having problems with the audio. Could you please check your microphone? Hello? Hello? Ah, you are back. I think that that, that sounds better. Okay, keep going. Oh, sorry, but well, uh, should I back up some? I mean, I don't know how far how long I was. Uh, we lost you for actually a few minutes, so uh, maybe you could just back up a little bit. That would be good. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know quite what happened. Let's see if I can back up here. Okay, should, um, did we... Uh, Give me a sign here. Do we know about this part? I think that's good. Okay, so the handling uncertainty part, I'm going to try and talk about it in the context of an example. Would that be a good place to kick back in? Alex? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sorry, folks. Well, um, yeah, so this handling uncertainty, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about it in an example uh, from RNA interference. Uh, this uh, genome wide. Uh, technology for understanding gene functions. And uh, just briefly about that, uh, you've seen the slides but didn't hear me say, uh, it's a cell-based assay. The basic idea is you uh, have a target gene that you're targeting with a given siRNA. You add that siRNA, small interfering RNA, to the cells. And uh, what's supposed to do is knock down the expression of that gene. And uh, if that targeted gene is involved in some phenotype that you're measuring, then that phenotype will change, and the cell is, will change, as I've indicated with the red. Uh, now, and, and in the story we're talking about, the phenotype has to do with the cell's ability to replicate virus. There are four large-scale studies that uh, use this technology genome-wide. And uh, we had data on, <coughs> on parts of these studies. There are all the studies that had an interesting similarity. There were two-stage studies with a detection screen and a confirmation screen. Uh, the whole genome was, was, was every, every one of the genes, different siRNAs were used to try to knock down things, and anything that passed the detection screen went into a confirmation screen that was more intensive, uh, but it only had to be applied to the things that were uh, detected initially. You remember, the detection has to do with whether or not, the phenotype here is whether or not a cell, when it's infected with virus, and you knock down uh, the gene, whether that changes the cell's ability to make virus. And one of the curious things here, as in other examples, is, <clears throat> is that um, uh, this, each, as I was saying, each of the studies made about 200 genes, found about 200 genes that they said, when you knock them down, it affects the cell's ability to replicate virus. But uh, only one gene was found in common to all four studies. A few genes were found in three of the four studies, some in two of the four, but the majority of genes that were identified and reported as involved in flu were uniquely identified in one study only. Could be because of false positives. Measurement errors, one but off targets is a big possibility where you add the siRNA and there's a change in the cell as indicated by the pink. But actually the gene that that siRNA is targeted isn't really involved in flu at all. It's just that the siRNA accidentally and not by design happens to knock down another gene that is involved in flu and then you see the phenotype even though you shouldn't have really. Uh, it could also be false negatives, and there's a bunch of possible false negative results. One uh, pos where it's just the, the genes really involved in flu, but you're somehow not able to uh, see it when you do the siRNA screen. For instance, you add the siRNA screen, uh, <coughs> you knock down the gene that's really involved in flu, but somehow or other there's another gene sitting there that's doing the job of the first gene in those particular cells, and so even though the gene one has been knocked down and is really involved, you don't see a phenotypic effect in those cells. There's a various other forms for the negatives and positives, but the big issue was whether or not, was where, which is, which is the source of disagreement. If, if, if um, false uh, positives were really a big deal, you wouldn't be surprised to see the lack of agreement because each study is just pulling up a bunch of random genes and so, it wouldn't be surprising that you wouldn't have much agreement. At the same time, it could be that the flu is really a big complicated thing, and in each of the studies really is just seeing a small part of it, and, so, and then the lack of those singletons really are true. So as I was saying here, so uh, to, uh, to, to bring it back to the context of Bayesian analysis, we have a probability model for the data we were able to 
compile and the data that we're able to compile is a kind of meta-analysis of what happens to each gene <coughs> across each of the studies, whether or not it was detected and whether or not it was confirmed. And we have counts, for instance, uh, how many genes or four genes that were detected in the first study and confirmed, they were detected in the second study not confirmed, and they weren't detected in the second two studies. Naturally, a multinomial likelihood. And that's the green is the data that we have, uh, detection and confirmation information. But we don't know a lot of things. We don't know whether the genes really involved in flu. We don't know. Uh, if it's accessible or if there's redundancies in that case. We don't know what off targets in, in that study for those sRNAs used. And we don't know a bunch of things generally about the system as a whole, about the rates of measurement error and efficiency. We have bits of information about that, but all those things we don't know. We can collect, we can put our, our heads together and try and figure out a probability model that links together all those things we don't know with what we know. You often see these these directed acyclic graphical representations of probability models to express dependencies, and that's what that is here. So uh, we use the tools of Bayesian analysis to come up with a probability distribution of the unknowns given what we do see. Well, so without going into any of the details of how the calculations go ahead, we work out a joint posterior distribution, and then we come down to the statement of marginal posterior distributions on quantities that we're actually directly interested in, these error rates. So, for example, theta 1 is a quantity of interest. It's a false discovery rate. It's asking. It's, a, it's something we don't know in advance, really. It's the chance that the gene would really be involved in flu if, in fact, uh, it was confirmed in the study. Is it? That's a... Uh, <coughs> pardon me, let me say this again. It's the chance that the gene is not involved in flu, and that's the idea zero, given that it's confirmed. So if it's confirmed, what's the chance it's not involved? That's a false discovery rate. It's a, this is a kind of a false positive rate. Well... We don't know that false positive rate, but in our calculation, we get a posterior distribution for the false positive rate. That's way down here. And similarly, we get a distribution for the false negative rate. And uh, this and some other similar calculations, basically, they've accounted for all the uncertainty and all those many, many things we didn't know in the context of a specific probability specification. And it tells us pretty unequivocally that false negatives are a bigger problem than false positives. And that lines up with some other, other analyses of the same data. But that's an, an example of using uh, marginal posteriors to, to get at particular quantities of interest and address those. OK, I'm going to move on to another example. Um, combining data. <coughs> this is where, you, so one of the big things about Bayes is that you uh, can combine multiple data sources. So um, I'm going to talk about. Uh, different data, X and Y, uh, coming together to make inference. This is a story about uh, cancer, and it's based on this amazing cr creature called an aggregation chimera that is formed from two early embryos that are fused together and planted into a foster mother, and then uh, once in a while, if it all works right, you get some animal out. It's really two separate animals, more or less, merged together for parents. Uh, here's a chunk of the intestinal epithelium of some, one of these animals. It's also been genetically engineered to uh, be susceptible to growing tumors in their intestine. And it's blue and white uh, color owing to the uh, two separate uh, parental lineages. This is, uh, the blues come from one side and the whites come from another. Now, curiously, in the middle, it's a little hard to see, but in the middle is a, is a tumor. And what's especially curious about it is that it's, it's two colors. It's blue and white. About 20%, in fact, of the tumors in these animals are uh, heterotypic. Now, if the standard story about biology and cancer growth, which, of course, we can't, uh, well, that's one of the cool things about cancer research is that we, and statistics for cancer research is you're talking about events that happen before you're able to observe them. But uh, the standard story about uh, tumors growing out of crypts, crypts being clonal, doesn't work <coughs> here because uh, if it did, they would be either pure white, because the cells in one lineage come are either white or pure blue, but they wouldn't be mixed together. So this is a kind of a polyclonality story. Now, there's a bunch of interesting statistical issues with the polyclonality. I just want to focus on one specific one that, uh, about the com combining information sources. So one information source is to do with the patchwork of the cell tissue of this lineage. Some of the cells come from one lineage, one of the originating embryos, some come from the other. So that patchwork, the beautiful patchwork that presents itself. 
Now, we'd like to know, in order to have an understanding of tumor initiation events, we'd like to know where the crypts are under there, but we don't get to see those. Now, on the other hand, uh, there's something, well, just to back up, they, there's something about the imaging <coughs> uh, technique that is not able to reveal the positions of the crypts in the blue-white images. Now, there's data on other animals that aren't uh, animals that are chimeric animals, but there's data on other animals, or at least they're not blue-white image animals, that show what these crypts look, organization look like. So we'd like to kind of merge, fuse this data with this data somehow, uh, and that's what the, the analysis that I'll show that tries to do. We, the reason we want to do this is because we're trying to understand uh, how, how many pairs of crypts are really on edges between blue and white that could potentially give rise to these polyclonal tumors. Well, so the data on one side, the X, is a pixel image, a blue-white image. The unknown quantity, theta, <coughs> yeah, the positions that we record as centers of positions of crypts. And uh, it's easy with some simple image analysis ideas to work out a likelihood. If you knew where the crypts were, what's the probability of seeing a particular image? You know that the crypts are pure, blue or white. Uh, there would be some flip error uh, at some small rate, which would flip a pixel. If it's supposed to be white, it might be blue. And then if you're a pixel that's not over a crypt, you might be uh, coming up by a background rate. So that's a, a one part. Now, we also have other, a second data source I was saying about the positions of crypts, <laughs> not in the data that we're interested in, in the blue-white image, but in another source. We can triangulate that image and look at those points. They're not scattered uniformly randomly around. In fact, they have uh, quite a bit of spatial structure that we can express with a kind of a spatial model on positions where we use the uh, actual interpoint distances to get an estimate of this so, so potential function for the joint distribution of spatial positions. So we try to put that together. We use the external data Y to tell us about what kind of patterns we might expect to see in the crypt orientation theta, and we, we want to use that to get, uh, we take the blue-white image to together to try and figure out what the crypt position might have been, in fact. This is one sample from the posterior distribution of the crypt position that I blow up here. And uh, I've colored the uh, crypts either blue or white, depending on the majority uh, color of the pixels above them. And the key thing had to do with these red edges. These are neighboring uh, crypts that are of opposite color. And so if a tumor might emerge from crypts nearby like that, there would be a certain rate at which that happens that we can estimate. And then, so based on this, we could get some idea of, about what the interaction distance might be in between crypts that are at the origin of polyclonal, tumor, polyclonal tumors. Okay, that's a quick run through of combining information. And in the last part, I want to, uh, in the last few minutes, uh, talk about uh, borrowing information, borrowing strength on information sharing. This is a big deal in genomics. Uh, <clears throat> you've got possibly many different but related inference problems. Uh, there are M of them, and I've got thetas are the unknown parameters in each one, and each one gives rise to a data set. They're separate but related in some sense. Now, there's two cases. I, we may ha The problems may be linked by some other parameter psi. We don't know any of the thetas or the size. We get the data. Now. It's a classic result going a long time ago that if you're interested in inference about the psi, that unknown linking parameter, you could screw up. Even if you get lots and lots of data, your standard estimates, the so-called maximum likelihood estimate, won't be consistent for that underlying parameter. It goes back to Neiman and Scott in 1948. And just a few years later, though, Kiefer and Wolfowitz <coughs> showed you could do a trick You've got a lot of those theta parameters, and if you, instead of just treating them as unknown quantities, you treated them as unknown quantities that came from a distribution, and you accounted for the fact that there was such a distribution, even if you didn't know it, you could get a, um, an estimate that now is uh, still an MLE, a maximum likelihood estimate, but it's acknowledging that the thetas are coming from a distribution, they're essentially random effects, then you could get consistent estimates of the unknown. So there was something just about having lots of parameters. When you had them, you ought to treat them as if they're from a population. That turned out to be important. Now here's another uh, related thing that happened long ago, too. Here's a parameter. I'll tell the story in three dimensions. There's three unknown related but separate problems, the three unknown quantities, theta 1, theta 2. 
and I'm going to get three data points, D1, D2, 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 D3, and the sampling model is that the data are independent, uh, centered on theta. So D1 is a data measurement that's estimating theta 1, D2 is estimating theta 2, D3 is estimating theta 3. They're independent things, so D1 has no effect on D2 and so on. The little ch code chunk on the right is actually trying to uh, simulate that. It simulates this for uh, a couple, for uh, various thetas. I, in fact, in this little code, I want to fix one of the theta one, fix theta two, and I'm going to run on a grid of theta three to show a picture. I simulate up some data. Now the question is, if I use the data, <coughs> I want to I want to use the data somehow to estimate the unknown quantities, the thetas. There's no psi in this story. There's just unknown thetas. I could use the standard estimate, which is to use the data themselves as estimates of their expected values. That's the standard estimate, which I, I calculate in this code, and I look at error uh, of, uh, of that estimate and I, in a way I'll show in a second. And then there's another one, a Bayes style estimate. I'll call it just Bayes style. It's the data, but I shrink it a little bit, just like back in this TAC problem where there was that shrinkage. There's a little shrinkage here that is a factor that, in fact, depends on the data. Now this is the plot of the error. <clears throat> the problems that were the separate but related problems had nothing to do with each other. The noise had nothing to do with it. But I'm going to assess the error of an estimator by combining the problems together and look at the average squared difference between an estimator and the thing it's estimating accumulated up over the three different problems. If I look at the standard estimator, that mean squared error is in the blue here according to that simulation. I'm, I'm fixing theta 1, theta 2, and I'm just letting theta 3 vary, just because it's hard to draw in three dimensions. If instead I was looking at the error, not of the standard estimator, but the error here of the Bayes estimator, I get a Bayes style estimator, I'll call it, you get uh, uniformly smaller. Uniformly smaller. So this is a, a fundamental finding from way back, that if performance evaluation considers all the tasks at once, all those related but separate problems, then the ideal pr procedure for, for the whole thing is not taken by assembling the ideal procedures for each problem taken in isolation. A fundamental fact that uh, James Stein figured out and that uh, in fact you can actually do better in frequency terms by using some kind of a Bayesian style procedure. Okay, how does this actually work? Uh, well, go back to the Kiefer Wolfwood story. You've got a bunch of related <coughs> but separate problems. I have unknown quantities, data, and I'm going to now treat them as if they come from a distribution in order to try and get some benefit. But of course, in reality, I don't know that I know the data, but I wouldn't know the distribution that had generated them. Of course, I have data, so maybe I could somehow or other estimate that distribution. Now, as I've estimated it, now I can think like a Bayesian and say, well, I have that distribution called G, which is essentially like uh, informally a prior distribution before I get data essentially associated with uh, all the parameters. So I can do a Bayesian style calculation by working out the posterior proportional to that prior times the likelihood piece. And here, this is the borrowing information part. This actually, I'm doing inference on a single unit, but this is the in, this has acquired information from all the other units in this in this two-stage process. Okay, so bar information is used a lot in genomics. I'm just going to close out with an example, RNA-seq, which is used for measuring transcripts quickly. Uh, we get samples of cells, messenger RNAs are extracted, they're converted to cDNA, they're read by the next-gen sequencing reads. Those reads are aligned to the genome. We get a, uh, We get some measures, rough raw measurements of how frequent those RNAs are in the sample of cells. We have to do some computation to get abundance estimates. You'll get multiple samples together. You'll normalize them to account for sampling specific artifacts. And then we get down here to a problem of differential expression. We want to know which genes uh, are significantly differentially expressed across different conditions. And the basic data structure that comes into the calculation, we've got genes. Uh, on the rows, we've got different samples along here, and those samples can be bundled up into multiple conditions. The basic measurement after all that processing is a basic measure of expression abundance of a gene I in a sample. I'm going to just say briefly something about a popular technique called EBSeq, which is deploying one of these information sharing tools in the context of uh, expression, and it's 
it's a popular one uh, because it has uh, some nice statistical properties that you can uh, get it at those places. Let me say quickly, I've, I've at my 1150, but I'm just going to just finish up with a couple of slides on the structure of this, if that's okay, Alex. Um, yes, it is. Keep going. Thanks. Okay. So how does the structure of this thing go? You've got multiple cell conditions. You've got gene level parameters. So these are parameters that have something to do with the distribution of the expression measurements in each condition. Uh, you get replicated, cell, uh, replicated expression profiles in various conditions 1, conditions 2, and so on. And each gene I is going to have some property. So for example, if we took the negative binomial distribution, which is an overdispersed, a, naturally, a, a natural distribution to use for count data, uh, I show for two different thetas here, possibly two different conditions on a given gene, what, uh, what the sampling distribution of the counts might be like for different expression for expression values here. If theta C was if point one was the expression, then if theta a uh, point one was the value, then this would be the fluctuation we'd expect to see for uh, of expression measurements in that condition. So at issue, so this is a natural probability distribution used, many people use it, but how can you use it in a way to borrow strength? At issue are, you know, you want to find genes where <clears throat> there may be really some difference in the thetas between the conditions. So coming to the borrowing strength part, we, we have a bunch of related but separate problems, those being the related, all the different genes. And we have parameters, theta, on one for each gene, and each one is a vector over the different conditions. And the key structure of EB, EBSeq is to do a, a first a discrete mixing over so-called patterns of agreement and disagreement between the condition level distributions. And then for any uh, latent variables, so that, that's a finite sum here. I'll give a quick example of that subsequently. And then you'll still have unknown thetas even uh, if, if you, even for a given pattern, you'll have unknown thetas and they'll come out of some mixing distribution, it's called. EBSeq also has some extra uh, bells and whistles to handle isoforms nicely and some other things that I won't say anything about. So that's a specific structural model for that distribution G. And we want to learn that from the data, so we use the EM algorithm to do it. Once we've learned it, we can apply Bayesian style calculation. What's the probability of a given pattern, given data? And here's where the patterns come in. For instance, a pat one pattern, if you have two conditions, one pattern is that the thetas on that gene <coughs> for the two conditions are the same. This is the no differential expression. That there's, there's no real difference between the two conditions in the average expression of the gene. Or another pattern might be there really is a difference in expression on the average between those two conditions and the expression of that gene. Basic null hypothesis, alternative hypothesis at the gene level. But the key thing about EBSeq is it's leveraging all the information across the genome to try and improve sensitivity and improve statistical properties of the final procedure. And part of that are local, so-called local FDRs, probability of the null being true given the data. And the list of discovered genes would be the things where that null probability is small. And then if it's null small, then there's a high probability of, of the alternative. So these are posterior probabilities calculated in the model. And there's a bunch of nifty formulas that you can work out for those probabilities in the case that's, that's considered. Uh, this just shows in a stem cell example how it would deploy where there's two conditions, human embryonic stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells different genes on this axis, these genes were discovered by the EBC analysis at a 5% FDR. And there, there's some nice features about that, about power and robustness that other uh, methods don't have such good properties on. Well, that's a pretty quick summary of that. I want to just go to my final couple of slides on closing remarks, and I appreciate your attention. Uh, benefits of Bayesian uh, analysis, handling uncertainty, as I've tried to describe with the flu problem where you've got a whole bunch of things you don't know and you go to a marginal posterior structure. Combining different sources of information, of data, that's based, is natural for that using the rules of probability. Borrowing strength when you have many related but separate problems and how you can use the collection of those to improve their statistical properties. There's a whole bunch of issues. There's computational challenges <coughs> where a lot of learning uh, statistical machine learning procedures involve optimization. Uh, Bayesian procedures use a lot of integration. So there's some different issues that come up and there's a lot of challenges, data science challenges there. Uh, a big issue, which uh, I think is something we all need to think about as we do this, is that this is all built on model specifications. 
And you can make mistakes when you specify a probability model. You, the specification might be too simple. If it's too simple, you're not going to learn much new from some uh, compared to some simple procedure. If it's too complicated, well, you risk all kinds of things. You risk making mistakes in the deployment of it. You risk that it's, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't uh, respect the properties of the data sufficiently well. So there's risks associated, and then the question in any given situation are the risks of making a screwy model specification. Uh, do they outweigh the benefits of improved power or improved sensitivity? And then finally, <clears throat> this is last, uh, I'll say the unknowns you know, don't know, you don't know. Bayes is all about unknowns and knowns and a joint probability distribution over all those things. Worry that the prior is the probability distribution of the things that you don't know, and then the likelihood is the probability of the data that you'll get to know conditional on what you don't know. And you work out a posterior distribution of what you uh, don't know given what you know. Except that doesn't work if one of the, you can't put a prior down on something you don't know if you don't know that you don't know it. And this is a fundamental issue uh, that uh, we have to deal with. And the way it's dealt with in, in practice is, is essentially through diagnostic procedures. Obviously, um, you know, all analyses are facing this thing, but we have to uh, be upfront about it. And so any model-based calculations we ever attempt to do, we need to accompany them. Predictive checks and diagnostics to make sure that we're not really fooling ourselves. I just want to end uh, by uh, dedicating this, these, uh, this short lecture to Steve Feinberg, who passed away too uh, soon uh, last year. He was a, a, a tremendous figure, had done tons of things for the field of statistics generally and uh, data science and Bayesian analysis and he had a positive impact on lots of people's uh, careers and I want to thank him for his contributions. And, uh, and I just want to say thanks again to you all for listening and I know it was quick but I, uh, the slides are available for you to look over and uh, here are some papers that I cited during. So thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. That was a great overview for Bayesian inference, and you covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. Um, so, and, and I appreciate uh, what a great job you did explaining a lot of the, the more challenging concepts in this space. Um, we have time for one quick question, which is, is somewhat linked to the last uh, point that you brought up about, about unknowns. Um, and, and I guess the challenge that we have a lot of times when we're dealing with data sets is one of both missingness and sparseness. Um, and so I don't know if there are any new techniques that you could comment on in terms of from the Bayesian perspective of how to deal with with those two, well, very separate issues, but um, if there are, there are recommendations or suggestions you could um, uh, make in that regard. Um, well, the I gather next week, I think Lance Waller is going to be talking about missingness, so I'm sure he'll have more uh, useful things to say about the first issue about missingness. But you're, you're right. I mean, very often uh, where you're trying to do your statistical analysis is in a kind of a gray zone where there's really a lot of stuff you don't have that you would like to have. And, it, and while that's a challenge, it's also a bit of an opportunity. It's like, what else are you going to do if uh, you the Bayesian strategy provides a sort of general approach. And then, uh, then the, you know, there's a lot of liberty that you have in terms of how you approach it. And what you do depends so much on the context of the situation, exactly what is the relevant information that you have or the relevant information that you don't know. What, uh, how can you uh, usefully summarize the data down? What parts of data should you not have summarized away. Uh, so it's, I think, you know, you need to, you, you need to sit yourself in this, this kind of a Goldilocks scenario where, you know, the model might be too simple, the model might be too complicated. If you have, if the problem that you're addressing is sufficiently important, you have enough time to think hard about it, then you could try something like this. And essentially what you need to do is write down some kind of probability structure for all those things that you don't know and exactly what that would look like. I mean, that depends very much on the context, doesn't it? Uh, I do, I would say that, you know, in some classical pro probability models like regression models uh, where sparsity is an issue that's very often t discussed with these penalized estimation procedures, lassos and all that, that um, more fully Bayesian tools f for understanding uh, the 
you know, good procedures in those situations are, have recently been, I think, under, uh, dis discovered and, and debated. So there's a group at work that's doing a lot with that. There's Nick Paulson's group in Chicago that's done a bunch of interesting things. So there's you know, the role and the structure of prior distributions when there's sparsity. So that, that is an active area. Uh, maybe that's as much as I can usefully say about it at, at the moment, but yeah, good question. Great. Well, we're at, we're at 10 o'clock, um, so I want to thank you for your time, and we'll end here. Okay, thanks, Alex. Thank you.